Burton. I served on the USS Oriskany for three years, uh, March 1954 to uh, January 1957. The Oriskany was, was a sister ship of the Hornet, and as it turns out, during that period of time, the Hornet and the Oriskany were both operating alternately as units of Task Force 77. When the Oriskany was out with Task Force 77, uh, usually from about February to August each year, the Hornet was here and Alameda are working up and down the coast. And when we came back, uh, the Hornet replaced us up with uh, Task Force 77. So uh, the time I spent on the uh, Riscany, uh, I think I had experiences that parallel to the experiences that OGs were having on the Hornet at the same time because basically we, uh, we had the same mission. I came aboard the Oriskany uh, as an ensign uh, in March of uh, 1954. Uh, after three days in Sasebo, we went to sea off the Korean coast, and immediately I was assigned to the bridge as a junior officer of the watch. This reference was made to J.O.W.s uh, before, and I can remember standing over in that corner of the bridge about 8 o'clock at night watching what was going on. The ship was involved with the task force maneuver, and I stood over in that corner, utterly confused. I had the foggiest idea what was happening or why, but that's the way my time on the, on the, the, the Bridge of an Essex class carrier uh, started. A year later, uh, as a brand new, as a fairly new ensign, I find, my, find myself as a senior watch officer uh, on the Riskin and over a two-year period, I made two cruises functioning up here as the, uh, as the LOD. Now, about the bridge itself, uh, typically there would be three or four people working out here, and I'll start with the captain, the most important guy uh, of all. Uh, it was my experience during that period that when we were at sea and operating aircraft that the captain was always here on the bridge. Uh, if we started the day with a launch at 5.30 in the morning, uh, the captain was out here at 5.30 in the morning. And you'll notice the chair, everybody knows what that is, the captain's chair, and by Navy protocols, he's the only person that actually used it. Uh, my captains never authorize anybody else to use it, but I know that certain OODs snuck into the captain's chair on the midwatch uh, from time to time with their feet and back uh, again to uh, the hurry. There's a sign here that refers to the captain's hours, uh, refers to an 18-hour day. Uh, I can verify that there were many, many times when I saw my captains uh, out here at 5, 5 36 in the morning, and I come up for the mid-watch, and here they are, still at midnight, we're landing aircraft, and they've been up here all day long. Uh, you notice a little table over here. Uh, that was both his desk and his dining table. Typically on those long days, he'd get breakfast here, he'd get lunch here, uh, he would get his dinner here. I don't know if it was a midnight snack or not, but uh, uh, he uh, got all of his food uh, here. Sometimes on uh, Saturdays or Sundays, uh, he would take his meals back in his sea cabin, or he would take them in, uh, in navigation. The next probably most important person up here would be the OOD, and uh, Bob here uh, has shared this experience with me. Feel free to comment. Uh, how, how, does, how are the OODs selected? Uh, I always thought in my case it, it began as a random event. For some reason or other, when I came aboard, the executive officer assigned me to the gunnery department, the deck and gunnery department. Well, as it turned out, the deck and gunnery department was the department that provided most of the JODs and the OODs uh, after training. Occasionally, someone else would ask uh, to stand bridge watches just simply because they wanted that piece of paper in their file that they had qualified as an OOD. So occasionally, if there was a junior navigator on board, uh, a new ensign, uh, that person would qualify. I remember once that uh, one of our communication officers asked to stand extra watches on the bridge just so he could get qualified. But for the most part, the OODs came out of the deck and the gunnery department. And usually it took about a year of training, at least, uh, standing watches on the bridge. Uh, most often they were sent to a special school down in San Diego. I was sent down to one several weeks. 
but uh, largely the selection process involved uh, on-site experience. You just you just learn you learned what to do by being here, observing it, practicing it, and finally uh, it, the uh, captain was the person who made uh, these choices on the recommendation of the navigator. Finally, if things worked out, uh, you might earn appointment as uh, as the underway uh, OOD. The junior officer, the, the way the duties were split up, usually the OOD had the con giving orders to the pilot house. Uh, he was responsible for implementing the daily flight schedule. Uh, every morning about uh, 4 o'clock or something like that, uh, a, a flight schedule would be delivered to the bridge. If I came on watch at 4, 4 a.m., I usually would find it on the desk up here. The flight schedule would list uh, all of the planned uh, launches and recoveries uh, scheduled uh, for the day. Captain and the LOD understood that the LOD would be implementing that schedule in the course of the day. How, how, how does he implement it? Well, by planning uh, the turns in and out of the wind uh, at the right times to facilitate the, uh, the launch or the recovery, whatever, whatever it is. Um, LOD was also responsible for the, uh, implementing the plan of the day, the so called POD. You're all familiar with that. Uh, but that was largely the, uh, the bosun mate's watch back in the uh, pilot house. And using one NCA throughout the course of the day, making various announcements to uh, carry out, carry out uh, activities planned uh, for the day. So the OD rarely had any real direct uh, involvement with that. Uh, I know you all know that the relationship between the OD and the captain is a pretty special one. OOD when he's on watch uh, he is in charge of the ship in the name of the captain and no one stands above him except the captain unless the captain uh, uh, directly authorizes somebody else uh, to give direct orders uh, to the captain. The exception of course is the executive officer but the executive officer uh, rare, very rarely on the risk of day, and I'm sure this is true but one of the executive officer very rarely spent any time in the bridge. He may come up to consult with the captain from time to time. Uh, the, uh, the only time he was on, on the bridge when we were actually doing something, usually it would be when we were first getting underway. And when, just before we cast the lines off when we were legally a ship underway, he would come up and make a report to the captain. And, and, then, and then he would leave. Uh, that relationship between the OD and the captain, in my experience, was uh, very carefully observed by all senior officers, including the navigator. As an OOD, I understood perfectly well that the navigator, other than the captain, was the most senior officer up in that area. And he was responsible for the safe navigation of the ship. But, but by the same token, he was not authorized under Navy regs to give a direct order to the OOD. As a practical matter, uh, I paid a lot of attention uh, to uh, the presence yeah. of the navigator and uh, you know, what, what, he, uh, what he had to had to say. You might suggest something. To you. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and, and, and you know, I, and I, I really counted on, on, on his assistance. I should, I, with regard to how the bridge is organized, in the case of the Hornet, it's probably worth keeping in mind that the Hornet had two basically different operational formats, and that, that affected what the OOD did up here. Uh, initially, when the Hornet was a CV and a CVA, an attack carrier, it largely, at sea and combat especially, operated as a unit of a task force. And it carried attack type aircraft. During the Korean War period, it was the Panther, the Cougar, the Sky Raider, you know, airplanes like that. Um, and in that context, uh, the Hornet carried, in addition to its own captain, it carried a staff, a, a flag officer, an, an admiral, and a level below us. And those two units obviously uh, had, to, uh, had to work together. But the OOD here on the bridge and that attack carrier type operation uh, had to understand task force structure, uh, received uh, tactical uh, orders from the flag, sea 
and, uh, and and usually it served as a guide ship for a, a task force crew. Um, and in a normal arrangement, uh, if you look at the diagrams that show those old task force, you find that uh, the Hornet as the flagship and the guide ship is, is sitting in the middle of the formation. And as a guide ship, the, the OD's job is greatly simplified. And how is that? It's simplified because as the guide ship, the OD doesn't have to maintain station on any other ship you know, in the task force. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a simpler job than otherwise might be the case if you were not, uh, not the guide ship. My experience uh, on, on the uh, on the risking, I'm sure this was the case uh, for the Hornet, was the captain was always here on the bridge during flight operations and during the replenishment procedure that uh, Rolf talked about earlier. Uh, he was here uh, in the chair monitoring things or walking around, but it was not the case that he was here issuing direction and orders to everybody in sight. That was all all delegated out, and especially it was a responsibility of the, uh, the OP uh, to carry out the, uh, all the routines. Occasionally, I've seen this happen. The flag officer running a task force or a task group this happened on the Griskin a couple of times. The, the, the admiral running the route, the flag, would designate a captain of one of the carriers as the, as the temporary OTC. And in the case of, for example, it's the Hornet, the Hornet's captain, then would be carrying out the functions of the flag for some particular period of time. Everybody would know that. It would be uh, announced by, uh, by radio or by flashing light. And in that situation, what happened, and it was quite unusual, uh, if you came on watch at 4 o'clock in the morning and the outgoing OD tells you, oh, by the way, uh, the captain is the OTC for the next 24 hours, lo and behold, you find the OOD, for practical purposes, at that time of day, uh, is the OTC for the, uh, for the group. Uh, and that gets to be uh, uh, an interesting kind of uh, situation. You know, OTC officer and technical command. Officer and technical command. Right. I came on watch, I remember one morning on the Ariskany at 4 o'clock and discovered that uh, Captain uh, West Holman was the OTC in his night order book. He simply said uh, to make all preparations for uh, launch at, uh, at 0600 in the morning. And, uh, and, and, and that was it. But uh, that meant that the Ariskany had to set, had to set the whole task force up for that morning launch. Now, in those, in those days, uh, the task force usually consisted of two or more carriers. And the ships were arranged in such a way that, let's say, if there's two carriers, the ships are sail sailing parallel to each other, broadside at the time that they're launching airplanes into the wind. And that's the way to separate their, uh, their flight patterns uh, uh, around, <coughs> around the ship. So uh, one of the first tasks in the morning was to figure out, you know, what what is what direction is the wind coming from, then rotating the axis around all the around the, which all the ships are are placed, so that when they turn into the wind, the two carrier carriers are parallel to each other and setting broadside, usually in a separation of only be four to six miles. Easy easy to see, it would be to the left or the right somewhere. Uh, but. Uh, with the captain as the OTC, it was up to the bridge watch to set that all up and have it all done uh, in time. That, that when you turned in the wind, you were right on the right on, on the course, course selected to straight into the wind at the proper time. And I recall that we we're uh, always conscious about that. That goes back to what Roth was, was saying. When you made that final turn in the wind, you wanted to swing around. If the launch was at zero six hundred. You wanted to swing around and be into the wind. 0558, so you only got a couple minutes between now and the time that you actually uh, launch, uh, launch aircraft. And uh, why, why such attention to detail? Well, partly it was just a matter of pride in mean, executing the, the, the launch on time. But the other thing everybody had in mind is the pilots are down there in those aircraft. 
know, they're burning up fuel, they have a mission to carry out, they're going to go out somewhere and come back, and you don't want them sitting down there unnecessarily burning up, burning up fuel. So we, uh, we really tried our darndest to be set up and steady a couple of minutes before the scheduled, uh, the scheduled launch. And, uh, usually uh, with a large launch, 20 to 25 planes, say something like that, uh, you're going to be set up and running into the wind for about 24 to 30 minutes, something like that. Uh, and, then, uh, and then there would be a turn out of the wind. And, and why are you turning out of the wind? Well, it's to make things more comfortable down there flight deck, but the, the other reason is, well, planes are being launched over Jim Baker, please come to the quarter deck. You have visitors. Jim Baker to the quarter deck. <coughs> we usually, we had a helicopter in the air, the Angel, riding on the on this, uh, starboard side of the quarter. So we would turn out of the, out of the wind and run downwind for a while to bring the helicopter on board. You wanted to do that running downwind because you didn't want a lot of a lot of wind coming down the deck when you shut the helicopter down. The rotors slow down if there's too much wind. The wind can catch them. The rotor tips down and can hit the deck and uh, break, uh, break uh, a piece off. That pretty much was the framework in which the Hornet operated when it was an attack carrier. Now I find, and we have another former OOD, uh, uh, who um, I, th I, th I think was the Kearsarge, served on the Kearsarge when it was a uh, was a uh, ASW car ASW uh, carrier, and uh, they operated in that format. They operated very differently. And I bring this up because, of course, that's exactly what the Hornet did in its last year. It was an ASW carrier, and as I understand it, the the, uh, the tactical situation they were working in was one where the Hornet operated as a unit of the task force, but not with it. Now, let's say you have task force 77. Well, the Hornet would be a task group or a task unit attached to that task force, but operating some distance from it in its anti-submarine warfare detection operation. And normally, uh, it would, uh, the Hornet would have been operating with something like uh, six to eight destroyers in a screen, no other carriers cruisers, uh, six to eight uh, destroyers arranged in the screen. They didn't have to have a formation axis because there was only one carrier in the middle and you weren't worried about your alignment with reference to any other carriers. That would be the case uh, in the old uh, uh, Korean War, uh, World War II uh, uh, situation. Any, any t any, the, the, the Hornet could turn into the wind, whatever it was, and you didn't have to realign where the destroyers were because they were equally spaced in a circle around you. Uh, the one exception of that is that even in, that, in those times, uh, the Hornet would have had a plane guard destroyer following it around. And somebody in that circle has to be designated as the plane guard, whatever it is that they're doing. And I assume that the way that worked is someone would just be nominated as the plane guard and then they would pull up in their, in their assigned position once they turned into the wind. But it might be a different ship depending upon the direction in which the, uh, the task force is going. Uh, Jim also uh, uh, left notes with us regarding what they did when they made contact with the sus suspected submarine. Again, it's very different from anything that the Hornet did before as, a, as, a, as an attack carrier. Um, if there was a sonar contact made, the first thing that would happen with, with the Hornet's own sonar, uh, if that happened, they would then use the radar or visual observation to check on that bearing to be sure to try to verify whether it's a sub or something else. And when they checked the bearing and found it was a destroyer sitting there right out there, then they would drop it as a false report. Uh, if, on the other hand, that was not the case, uh, then two things would happen. First, the carrier would immediately turn away from the contact point and run in the other direction. And two destroyers would be assigned to, they were, they use the word, prosecute the target. I thought that was an interesting choice of words. Uh, investigated, I guess. 
the, the purpose here being to get the get the hornet itself, the mothership, as far away as possible from this threat. I mean, one, one of the two destroyers uh, attempt to chase it down. Uh, the second situation is where the contact, the sonar contact, is picked up by one of the destroyers in the screen, in which case, essentially, the reaction was the same. Uh, the hornet uh, turns and goes in the opposite uh, direction. Uh, and uh, with uh, the destroyers, and again, detailed uh, to prosecute uh, the target. And, and then the third situation was where the contact would be picked up by one of the ship's aircrafts, you know, way out there somewhere, and that situation then uh, the would just continue on its merry way as they continue to investigate uh, the, uh, the target itself. So uh, the, here, here in the bridge, the, the bridge watch uh, operated quite differently uh, than, than in the, uh, the uh, attack task force function. As, you usually had the captain here, and you would have, of course, the LODs and JODs, but there was also, as far as I can tell, and looking at the, uh, we're going to have to move. Uh, as far as I can tell, there was a tactical communications officer manning this station right here. That's what this table was for. And he worked back and forth with CIC uh, and the captain in detailing. Uh, the dispatch of the destroyers and deciding which direction to go and get away from the, uh, this, the uh, target that's uh, being investigated. We're, we're going to have to move down the flag bridge now. There's a group right behind us. We are now located on the uh, Admiral's flag bridge. This is the 05 level uh, right below the uh, captain's bridge. Uh, this space has been recently opened just a couple of months ago and we're still learning how to run tours through here. I think everybody is most of the docents are inventing their own speech as they pass through. Uh, but I have created a little handout, a series of notes uh, that I've passed out to all of you that I hope uh, will, uh, will be helpful. Uh, for background, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, this flag area was has not been occupied uh, throughout all of the Hornet's operating life. Uh, there was uh, three different flag officers who had their uh, flags on the Hornet uh, in 1944 and 1945. Uh, and there were a couple again during the Korean and Vietnam War period and a few, a few after that. Well, we don't have any documentation available to us uh, as to exactly how long they were all here and, and the kind of, kind of staffs it had. So I've, tried, I've put a picture together that's based in part on what I've been able to pick up from old histories on the Hornet. And what I know is uh, about the way the Oriskany was set up. In my three years on the Oriskany, we had a flag on board all the time. And occasionally, uh, I would be invited to visit the staff area space back here. So uh, based on those various sources, uh, I put together this series of notes, and I will go with you. Uh, I think most of us have the impression, I do, that it, once you've completed the tour above, you pretty well don't have anything much to say about the equipment here. It's, what's here is pretty much the same thing as uh, up above. Uh, the radar, uh, compass repeaters, uh, and a uh, rudder, uh, and of course and speed indicator here, uh, communication system. Uh, it, it replicates to some degree more or less of what's above and there isn't anything really much new that you can say about it. Uh, why two chips? Well, the Admiral is uh, entitled to uh, have a chief of staff and in the case of flag officer, the two-star level, the chief of staff is normally a four-strike captain. So down here you have a chief of staff who is in terms of rank and seniority probably outranks uh, the Hornet Hornet's captain, but by merit of that, he's entitled to his own chair. <laughs> Whatever their policies were and exactly how they used uh, the chairs, uh, I don't know. The first admiral uh, to be assigned here uh, was, uh, they call him Jocko Clark. Some of you read about him. Uh, he, he came aboard in, uh, in March of 19, uh, 1944 and, and brought his staff aboard with him. He actually had two periods as the flag officer here. Uh, 
uh, in between his two assignments here, uh, a person named McCain and another one, uh, Alfred Montgomery, uh, also flew their flags uh, off the Hornet. Uh, and this was a period, March 44, June 1945, when the Hornet was involved in the Battle of the Philippine Sea. Leyte Gulf, uh, where the Hornet went off chasing the Japanese fleet, under orders uh, handed down by Bullhousie, you remember. Uh, and then they, uh, uh, they were also at uh, Okinawa and some of the first assaults on Japan. So looking back in that period of time and envisioning these spaces, the Hornet flag space was a hot location. A lot and a lot of activity. The flag staff in those days and uh, in the 50s when I was on the Ariscany was a transient group. They were not permanently assigned, for example, to the Horn or the Ariscany. And, and the flag could elect any, any, any carry he wanted as his flagship. And what's often said, and it's consistent with my experience, the flag officers like to take the newest carriers. So when the Hornet came online in 1944, it was the newest carrier, the newest fast carrier. And undoubtedly that was the reason, the reason why the Jocko Clark uh, selected the Hornet. As the years went by, the Hornet became less and less attractive uh, as, a, as a flagship. What is the flag staff? Well, in, in the 40s and 50s, Typically, when the flag came aboard, he brought with him a staff of about 90 people, 90 to 100. Uh, I, I, I checked out the ratio of officers to enlisted there, and it went about, say, 15 officers and 85 enlisted. For the most part, their technical specialties paralleled many of those uh, permanently assigned to the ship as the ship's company. So you'd have a yeoman and a quartermaster, aerology people. CIC and so forth. Uh, not all of the staff operated out of this room behind us, and the reason for that is that the, uh, the Admiral staff was uh, uh, organized somewhat along functional lines, and those included uh, operations and plans, supply and logistics, surface operations and gunnery and air warfare. Well, if you go down that list, you'll realize that there were parallel uh, functions being carried out by the ship's own company as well. And indeed, the Admiral would normally post, for example, somebody down in CIC. Maybe a CIC watch officer from the Admiral's flag as well as a, as a senior watch officer from the ship's company that would be running the show down there. By the same token, it turns out, if you look at uh, nature of the, uh, the flag staff that there were many locations on the ship, many uh, uh, officers and enlisted, who directly provided support to the Admiral's staff. Uh, navigation is a good example of it. Uh, uh, Rolf didn't get onto that this morning at all, but uh, the navigation department on the Hornet also provided navigational data to the flag, and there's indeed a DRT uh, in here. It's not not as good a shape as the one up above. Uh, but the, the Admiral kept a quartermaster on his big DRT, and there was one operating up above in the chart room as well. But the DRT and the navigational fixes coming from the ship were taken as given uh, by the flag. Uh, CIC provided direct support. Uh, I noticed in the case of the Riscany that the flag had an aerologist. At the same time, that the Hornet and the Riscany had its own neurology department. Uh, they must have worked together uh, in some fashion. The main point being that while the Admiral and his flag came aboard as a transient group and came to left and could go anywhere, once they came aboard, they also got very important technical support from, uh, from the, ship's, uh, the ship's company. Uh, I was talking about task force arrangements before. I know you all have seen this, seen this diagram, and uh, this is really very pertinent because of the date on this T 
task force configuration is March 24th, 1945, and that's when Jocko Clark Hold it there was a out of here. So when you come down, uh, in, the, in the way in which you might organize your tours through here, uh, I think the, the flag, this flag area is a good place if you have time as part of the tour uh, to talk about task force organization. How they, how they actually did things in those days, and what the logic was of this circular, uh, circular arrangement. And you'll notice uh, there's the carrier smack in the middle, and there's the hornet right dead center in the middle uh, as, uh, as the flagship. It's a, it's a good place to explain the relationship between the captain of the hornet on the one hand and his staff up in the flag up above, and their relationship on the other with the admiral and his, 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 his staff here. This particular di diagram was uh, also uh, named some uh, a number of ships that we've all, all heard of. And I think there's a, there's a, a status board just signed inside the doorway here uh, where the names of a number of destroyers are written down. I think a couple of those are actually <laughs> actually on this uh, on this drawing, uh, which is also a convenient way of hooking up to some discussion of what takes place here versus up there. Uh, apparently, uh, in those days, and I'm not sure how they do it these days, the, it's the flag, it's the flag that sets up the daily air schedule for the carriers in a task force group. Uh, normally they do that planning, uh, I check this out in my cruise boat in 1956, that planning is done by uh, the uh, flag flag officers the day before, and uh, probably distributed by by radio or maybe by flashing flashing light. But each each carrier in the task task force task group gets a gets a flight schedule, and the, and the, and the trick is say you have four carriers is to synchronize the flight operations in those days to ensure that at least one carrier. And that group has a ready deck. That's to say, it's ready to receive aircraft. Either somebody maybe on the launch who got in trouble, or somebody who's coming back from a mission is in real trouble and can't get back to his own carrier, or his own carrier is shut down because of an accident of some kind. Uh, it's, it's one of the parameters that the planners uh, uh, build in to the assignments that are made each day. Now, up, up in the bridge there, you don't you don't know this. All you know is there's a certain time of the day when you have the ready deck and, and you just keep it open in case of emergency. I remember one day we had the ready deck. We had taken our own planes aboard. Uh, when the air boss came up on the 1MC and he said uh, uh, in the open, uh, get ready, we've got, we've got the uh, plane coming back. Uh, he's, uh, he's aiming for, I think it was the uh, Bun on Richard, but he's low on gas. So we turned around and we looked looked down the flight deck and saw this banshee crossing our wake on you know, one or two behind us, headed for the Bon Richard, which was sailing broadside to us off for four or five miles. All of a sudden that plane made a sharp right hand turn. Like that. Boy says, Get ready, here he comes. He comes in, he makes this beautiful landing. Touches down, gets a good hook, hook up, and then there's no movement. And the air boss comes up and says, "Get the tractors down there. He's out of gas." Oh. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. The last drop. <coughs> you know, if it happened a little sooner, uh, he just went on right into the fan tail. But there we were. We had the ready deck for him. He couldn't make it to his own carrier. And, uh, just, just mm -hmm. away. Okay. Uh, I hope you'll find what's said here uh, useful. Let's go inside for just a minute. We are on, we are on the flag ridge, uh, 05 level, uh, and we are currently in uh, the, the uh, flag's staff uh, work area. Um, we don't know, we have we have no documentation as to how many people and what uh, types we're actually we're working down. here on a regular basis. I can remember on the Oriskany coming through that door and saying maybe a half a dozen people 
uh, here at the active. There certainly would be a person working on the DRT. Uh, there probably would be someone uh, monitoring the radar and maintaining the surface plot, uh, which is this board right behind us here. And in fact, we have on Sunday uh, is Reed Isaacson, one of our Sunday docents who worked in CIC on the Hornet. Uh, tells us that he from time to time would be detailed here uh, to flag to monitor the radar and maintain the surface plot on this board. By surface plot I mean a plotting of the position of all ships in the task force and any you know, contacts that might have been picked up uh, by, the, by, the, by the radar. This just allows the staff here at a glance to see the format of the current uh, uh, disposition of the uh, of the task force. Um, this is an important station over here. Up in the bridge, of course, you have the OOD uh, running the watch on behalf of the captain. Down here, there is also an officer of the watch. I think they call him the tactical communicator. And this would be his workstation. Uh, he would have a radio telephone. And he would be the person issuing verbal maneuvering orders to the task force by radio telephone. Now, in the case of the Hornet, perhaps during World War II, uh, having to observe radio silence, he couldn't do this by radio telephone, he nonetheless would be the person on direction from uh, the chief of staff, probably, uh, who would direct the signal bridge to run up turn and speed orders stationing orders to the to the task force by by my flag. In my day in the fifties there, all of the tactical directions came by radio telephone and you would have a watch officer here and well a handheld look like a telephone and you just pick that up and the, the task force would have a a collective call name, let's just say it's something like Bluetooth. And he'd come up on the radio and he would say Bluetooth uh, this is Jehovah. That was the flag's call name. <laughs> it was kind of common. Bluetooth, this is Jehovah. Execute to follow. And then he would give like a turn order, a speed order, or rotate the axis, axis of the formation, something like that. And then he would say, uh, over. And he would wait for all ships in the task force to call in and say, <clears throat> Jehovah, this is little boy, roger out. That means we got your message and it's understood. And there would be a check off list here, or maybe that status board over there, and somebody would check off each, each ship's response so you knew they all got, got the word. And, uh, and then the next thing would be he'd come back on and he'd say, Bluetooth, Bluetooth this is Jehovah, standby, execute. And then all the ships would do, implement the order of whatever it was. So the person standing here would be the guy, uh, I, I always wondered who, Je who, who Jehovah was. <laughs> In three years I never knew who Jehovah was, <laughs> but I certainly recognize his voice. <laughs> Amuses me about the selection of that particular name. Uh -huh. So, um, I think uh, it was Task Force 77. Oh yeah, that's yeah. That was that, his that, actual that code his, sign. That was right. his. That was his sign. Yeah, the, the uh, OTC of Task Force Seventy Seven was known as Jehovah. So uh, that's really about it on this space. Uh, there isn't a whole lot you can say in here except to talk about uh, you know Task Force organization, the relationship between the flag and the captain of the Hornet. And, Dennis, one of the things on communications, uh, you could point out this, this set of red, the red phone, more or less. Oh, yeah. It's not to the, to the president, but it's a classified, and the captain has one next to his seat up above. And where does it go? Mm -hmm. It's it, uh, off the uh, ship. It's an air broadcast. Well, Dennis, go ahead. And well, you'll see uh, this this red phone system uh, painted red. Uh, there's another one on the bridge, which we saw, and uh, there's one down in CIC. Uh, I know of three locations where they are located, and there might be some others too, but those are the principal three. And this is an encrypted communication system. It allows a person to speak 
directly with a receiving station, and I guess the words are scrambled in, su in some way in code form that allows the messages to be transmitted in a form that no one else uh, can understand. That's what they mean by encryption. And, um, I had thought this was a connection to uh, Syncback Fleet or uh, Pentagon. No, it was, it was a broadcast that other people locally could pick yeah. up, and uh, it was their broadcast. Okay. It had a pretty long range. But it was in, in, encrypted, and he would call off. It could be like from Jehovah, and he's going to put out some classified information yeah. to all the ships that were listening okay. in on that. Oh, okay. So it's just like another radio broadcast, but it's encrypted. All right. I also understand, though, that it can you, it, mm -hmm. you can be um, connected up with uh, stations in Washington D.C. For yeah, example, yeah, it's, it's got to be a patch, though. It has to be a patch. Okay. You have to be patched in. To, uh, other systems to do that, but it, it allows the flag and the captain to communicate long distance with uh, high level, high level officers. I've started talking about the uh, the pneumatic tubes back there to the, to the comp station, comp center. Got to kick out of those, the bunny tubes. Mm-hmm. Let's see, talking. This is how they communicated back to oh, main yeah. com. Right? Yeah, you can send those little send uh, little bunnies. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you know, how things get connected to everything else it kind of slipped away here today, which has got developed very differently than I thought. But uh, if you go on the Radio Central, uh, Radio Central was in a position to receive messages intended for the Admiral and shoot them directly up here. And same thing, they could say, do the same thing to the Captain's Bridge. And when you go in there, you'll notice that right at the watch officer's desk on a bulkhead opposite, there are there are the pneumatic tubes opening, and one of them is labeled flag, and another one's labeled captain. So uh, there's also one of the little bunnies down there. Yeah. Is there? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's similar to what you have at banks when you're yeah. outside the yeah. bank. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Right. So uh, that's another example of how other other stations on the ship uh, provide support to uh, to the flag. I think, as I recall, that normally if you came in here on any day when uh, when aircraft are being flown and the, and, the t and the task force is involved with an exercise of some sort, you you normally have got six to eight people in here doing various things. Uh, I'm not sure uh, about the admiral how much time he spends here. I do know that on the uh, on the Ariskany, our flag was frequently seen in this area. Um, there's a debate in the case of the Hornet. There's a, a, a sea cabin just outside this doorway that's also part of this complex, not open yet, but eventually it will be. But there's a plate uh, just over the doorway to that sea cabin that says Chief of Staff. So uh, most of us, I think, have looked at that have concluded that apparently that was the Chief of Staff's sea cabin. Uh, of course, there's an import cabin as well, which we've all now seen. But apparently, the, when, the, when the Hornet was at sea, and, in, and actively involved in operations, uh, it, it appears that the chief of staff probably used this cabin outside this doorway here. Uh, although I'm sure that if the admiral just decided that he wanted to spend his time up here, that he could commandeer that space, and he, he would be in there. And I'm pretty sure that was the case on the risk when I was on board. I think our admiral was was bumped up here during the It looked to me like the big room was the admiral's sea cabin, and the little one was the chief of staff's sea cabin. Well, there's only but one I bed in there, isn't there? Well, but there could have been another bed in the other room. I, I mean, think that was know. an office. Was it? Uh, okay. Yeah. I wasn't I sure. You know, was it's kind of funny. That given the relative separation of the import and at sea cabin, there's about a 20 second difference if you get up here from the sea cabin or the, yeah, or the uh, right. import cabin. So it doesn't make a lot of difference not, not for not them. Lot, yeah. Whereas with the captain of the ship, it, it yeah. did. Well, you remember what Admiral Brown told us on that tour of the uh, import cabins there several weeks back. He said, what he said was he rarely came up here. He met with his staff at 9 o'clock in the morning. They spent an hour and a half planning things. Then the staff went off, went off to implement the plans, and he could go play golf <laughs> and the rest of the day. I think that was maybe sort of a tart thing to be saying. But uh, he, he implied that once, once the plans for the day were set up, he didn't really have all that much to do. Uh, I'm, I'm certain that did not hold for uh, for, for Jocko Clark. No, not in wartime, yeah. Uh, in wartime, when this was, uh, he probably stayed close to this area up here. You all done?
Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Good job. Yeah. Thank you. That was great. Okay, this is uh, Admiral uh, Jocko Clark. You want to tell us about him? This is uh, introduce you to uh, the uh, first flag officer that flew his flag on the, the USS Hornet uh, shortly after it was uh, commissioned. His full name is uh, uh, Jocko Clark, was uh, what he was called, is a two star uh, rear admiral. Uh, came aboard the uh, Hornet for the first time on uh, March 14, 1944 and brought his staff of all about a 90 to 100 people uh, who worked in the spaces where this photograph is on display. Uh, Jocko Clark was uh, commanded uh, a carrier task force, a uh, carrier division of about four ships and alternately he was also the task force commander for task force uh, group 58.1 uh, in 1944 and 45. Uh, he was aboard uh, the Hornet uh, as a flag officer when it uh, participated in some of its toughest combat missions, the Battle of the Philippine Sea, uh, the Battle at Leyte Gulf, and later uh, at uh, Okinawa and assaults that were made directly in the, against the Japanese uh, home islands. He actually was on board the two different periods, uh, each time about s six months long. Okay, well thank you very much. You're certainly welcome. You're welcome.